All right, so again, where are we at? Where are we going with the story? We're still hanging out with linear mappings because they're the best. Um, and what are we going after now? So we've we've to recap what we've proven. So we've set up what linear mappings are. We've talked about how right the text is that they're just mappings that preserve scaling and addition. The subtext that they are the right things to look at when you're studying vector spaces because they don't mess up the structure a vector space has. And as you go forward in your math life, that's something you will always focus on. If you're studying a set with properties, you want to look at the functions that don't screw those properties up, whether they're algebraic or uh, topological, um, which is code word for you got continuous functions and they're nice. And other sorts of things. It's a, definitely a cornerstone idea of mathematics. Uh, and that naturally led to um, us talking about isomorphisms, which were the invertible ones and giving us a way of classifying vector spaces. And then we talked about, well, linear mappings in general are basically just matrices in disguise. So we specifically proved that every mapping from Rn to Rm is indeed a matrix multiplication. And vice versa, given a matrix, the matrix multiplication gives you a linear mapping. And we gave a full characterization too for any finite dimensional vector space. There is always a matrix that represents it. And in fact, there are multiple matrices that can represent your linear mapping, depending on the bases you use for the domain and the codomain. Right. So we did that all for finite dimensional. Um, and as I noted, you actually can do this for higher dimensions. It gets uh, trying to get it to work. Um, I, like I said, one of my, um, uh, I don't call them for acquaintances. Let's call it pals uh, from uh, Poland uh, did did something with like an infinitely large matrix once. I went to a talk and he was it was nuts what he was doing. It's possible I've seen it, but that, that's that's some deep lore. We don't need that for what we're going after. Okay, yeah. So what's next then on the docket? Because um, it seems like that's pretty exhaustive of like things you can do with linear mappings. Like what else could there be? Well, there is quite a bit more, and in fact, the goal for today is to set the stage for what I would argue is probably the most important theorem that we're going to prove in this class. Um, I'm sure others would probably not agree with me. Okay, this joker, because he doesn't even give the theorem its right name. Uh, we'll get to it. But so uh, what we're going to do today is what I would consider like the theorem for a course. So a lot of your upper level math classes usually have like a fundamental theorem or like a like a just a result that's like this is this is it. <laughs> this is the thing. Fundamental theorem of calculus, fundamental theorem of algebra. Um I don't know if there's a fundamental theorem of graph theory. I bet there is. I'm completely ignorant of combinatorics and graph theory. I've got no idea what the hell's going on in either of those uh, branches of math. I never took it um as an undergrad and I did not take it as a grad student. So I know nothing of those. I probably should know, seeing how like all my friends in the department are all like discrete math experts. I don't know. The only thing I know about graph theory, the Peterson graph. If you got if you if you've got something you think is true, it's not. Check the Peterson graph. That's the only thing I know. Okay, so for us, then we're going to hit what I would consider like the theorem for uh, linear algebra. Right. So uh, let's set the stage here for it. Um, so we talked about this last time. Um, so we noted matrix multiplication gives you a linear mapping, and linear mappings have subspaces associated with them. Right, we proved that linear mappings preserve subspaces under images and inverse images, and two of those that are interesting the kernel of your linear mapping which is the pre-image of the trivial subspace uh the inverse image you can interchangeably use those words um right which is just a set of points that map to zero okay. so this is indeed a subspace of r3 and then the range uh, again not the same thing as the codomain the range subset of the codomain um is also a subspace all right so All right, so uh, for any matrix, we can create this linear mapping, and then we have access to these subspaces, and we investigated these in a lot more detail than just, well, you can create these sets. Specifically for the kernel, we found that it, we can find a basis for it consisting of two elements. All right, and we 
I learned how to do that. And then we did the same thing for uh, the range. We demonstrated that the range was in fact one dimensional. So actually my linear mapping here, all of its outputs are just a multiple of the vector one, two, which isn't too surprising considering that the two rows were scalar multiples of each other. So that's not shocking, at least. Hopefully it's not shocking. All right, cool. So uh, something we then noticed was that our two by three matrix, the dimension of its uh, kernel of the linear transform that uh, it induced was two, and the dimension of its range of the linear transform that it induced is one. And oh, wouldn't you know it, two plus one is equal to three. So in other words, the dimension of the kernel plus the dimension of the range was the number of columns. Ooh, that sounds like, that sounds like a theorem. That sounds like some 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 stuff right there. Okay. But right, one example does not prove anything. And if you're being really careful, you could just simply go, well, you only had three columns, and the dimension of the kernel is any number between zero and three, and the dimension of this is any number between zero and two. Right. So the odds of their sum equaling three, yeah, you know, they're not bad. So maybe you just lucked out. Well, spoilers, we didn't luck out. All right. Indeed, this always happens, and in fact, is probably the most important theorem in linear algebra. So let's set the stage a little bit more here. Okay. So given a matrix, we define its null space to be the set so that a times x is equal to zero. So in other words, um, and we'll I'll have this typed up, but let's talk about it. Note that the linear mapping defined by the matrix multiplication. The null space of our matrix then is simply just the kernel of the linear mapping it induces. Okay, so indeed, this is guaranteed to be a subspace. So that's good news, hence the name null space. So space indicating that it's a subspace and null that, right, it, it's everything that maps to zero. Um, of course, another way of viewing this, which we'll get to, is that this is the set of solutions of homogeneous systems of linear equations. So again, that is our goal after we finish up these notes on linear mappings to bring all of this back to linear systems. And yeah, 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 we've kind of already talked about this repeatedly and kind of like winked like, hey, by the way, this is the solution set to a homogeneous system of linear equations. Um, so yeah. Okay, now the more interesting one is the column space. I think uh, the null space, um, at least in my experience when I first learned this stuff, I always thought the null space was the one that made the most sense. The column space was always like a little clunkier to think of. The column space is the collection of things in Rm so that y is equal to a matrix multi is equal to a times x for some x. So you care about the y that can equal in a times x for some x. You don't care about what the x is, you just care that y is equal to some a times x. Okay, so that is the column space. And in my experience, like this, this is the one that's a little, that I always felt was a little wonkier to think of. Um, this one to me, it was just like, oh yeah, makes complete sense. Solutions to the homogeneous, got it. Um, but this one is a little bit more. But right, note that kind of already reveal it for the null space, but right, this is the kernel of the linear transform induced by the matrix, and this is the range of the linear transform induced by the matrix. So the two subspaces that we've already mentioned, we now give them fancy names and uh, different symbol and proprietary symbols um, because they are of utmost importance indeed, right? So the null space is uh, denoted as null A, the column space is call A, and these are both subspaces of their respective uh, locations, the null space being the kernel, so it's a subset, subspace of Rn, and the column space being a range, a subset of Rm. All right, so here are the two fundamental subspaces associated with any matrix. It's column space and it's null space. Um, now, there are two other subspaces that are important when it comes to a matrix. Um, and not to spoil anything, but it's the null space of A transpose and the column space of A transpose. Um, those end up playing a very important role, and we'll, we'll see how A transpose gets involved um, later on when we get into systems. 
Um, but so normally when somebody says the fundamental subspaces of a matrix, they mean those four, although two of them are just you replace A when it's transpose. More on that when we get there. But anyway. All right. Cool. All right. So these uh, subspaces of Rn and Rm are of very high importance as we so I've been defined, let's uh, do some things. So the first thing we're going to verify is that there's another way of thinking about the column space. So specifically the column space is the span of the columns. So that's what Bob Slice said, uh, right? I always thought the column space is a weird thing to think of, like the setup. If you think about it as this, the span of the columns, maybe it works a little bit better. Where you're like, oh, okay, it's the things that could be written on your top of the columns. At first glance, though, this is definitely a something you can do, but why kind of thing. But the but why becomes more apparent as you go forward. Like a lot of things with math, we do a lot of setup in the beginning, going like, this is going to be a big deal. Trust me, you're going to love it. It's a way of life. All right. Okay, so yeah, let's prove that the column space is, in fact, anything that lives in the linear combination of the columns of the matrix, hence the name. All right, so suppose you're in the column space. That means there is an x so that you're equal to a times x. Uh, but as we noted, the matrix multiplication, a times x, is, in fact, a linear combination of the columns, where the scalars are the entries of the vector x. And so there you go. Well, he's got to be in the span. It's a linear combo. And, and this is a, a great example of a proof where once you get the forward direction, the reverse direction is, hey, read that backwards. So specific, conversely, if y is in the span, there are scalars so that you're equal to the linear combo, then define the vector to have these scalars as its entry, and then y is equal to a times x. And so y is in the column space. Right, hey, there we go. So, column space, uh, the span of the columns, hence the name. Right. Also, it is the range of the linear transform induced by the matrix, uh, which that's how we defined it, but we'll find a lot more use for this, but it's always good to keep in mind that it is related to the linear transform, and that will play a role when we get to um, talking about solutions to systems of linear equations. All right, cool. And in the event you've never seen the Columns 3 box art, go ahead and check that out. It's an all-time classic. Uh, columns 3 is some game from the Sega Genesis, if I remember right. Um, and the box art is... Mm, it's, 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 it's high quality art. I try to sneak in dumb titles every so often, when I remember to. All right, cool. Yeah. Uh, and here's another dumb chef, chess reference for you. Um, all right. So, uh, yeah, yeah. The ranks being the the horizontal on a chess where the file is the vertical. Um, anyway. All right, so uh, given a matrix A, uh, M by N, the column space, as we noted, is always a subset of our M. And hey, Rm is finite dimensional, so the column space must be finite dimensional, right? That there, there's no way this dimension is infinite. That would be bad news. That means there's an infinite linearly independent set, which cannot happen. This can only ever have a linearly independent set with no more than m elements. So this must be finite dimensional. And um, its dimension is incredibly important, and we call that the rank of a matrix, hence the name up here. So hey. Finally, we have a definition for the thing that uh, I mentioned about from this guy here, um, right? Uh, so the previous textbook we used, 317, defined rank like almost immediately. It was like the first thing they did, but they didn't have dimension set up yet. So they had to come up with this really goofy way of talking about rank. And I was like, oh my God, why are you doing this? And... So I was like, oh, Jesus, it's so it's so terrible. Like the way they can they, they they set up like an equivalent definition for it. It's like the number of pivot columns, and it's like it's technically correct, but it's like who the hell even cares about pivot columns? 
I'm sure somebody really cares, but like in terms of like actually working with matrices, it's just, anyway. Probably don't have that recorded. Me saying that I get my math license revoked, but I'll fight somebody on that one. I think Pivot called some. That's some bullshit engineers made up. But anyway, uh, but yeah. So our book defines rank after they define dimension. Thank God, so they can actually properly define what the rank is, the dimension of the column space. Um, but like I noted, your book it was this book was too eager to get the column spaces because they didn't have linear transforms so the fact that the column space is actually the range of the linear transform reduced by the matrix can't use it so they have to cook up a different so when they want to talk about the rank which in terms of linear systems rank is incredibly important they're still training themselves and having to make these like really like, just awkward arguments hence why we've gone uh, out of order but anyway, here it is, the thing that's, that set me off finally. I was following the book, more or less, and then um, then I got to the point that I'm like, oh, no, I can't do this anymore. Anyway, okay, so there's rank. All right, so it is the dimension of the column space. Burn that into your brain. Rank is dimension of column space. There are a few other equivalences for it, but the real one, the real the actual useful definition, the one you can actually do computations with. It's the dimension of the column space. All right, so the first thing we're going to note is that the dimension of the column space, the rank of your matrix, is bounded above by not only the number of rows, but the number of columns. The number of columns makes sense. It's the dimension of the column space, but right, the number of rows having a restriction on it seems kind of interesting. But it's not too hard to see why this goes down. Let's take a basis for the column space. That's a linearly independent subset of Rm. The column space lives in Rm. So the rank, which is the dimension of the column space, can't exceed m. The dimension of the column space would be the size of this basis. And it's a linearly independent subset of Rm. So we know by sign its exchange that that does not exceed m. Okay, so there you go. Rank is definitely less than or equal to m. And furthermore, as we prove, the column space is the span of the columns. And B is a linearly independent subset of this. So applying Steinitz exchange again, we know that the number of elements of B cannot exceed N, right? Because in a span of N things, the most amount, the most, uh, the largest amount of linearly independent things you can have is the number of things you use to span. You can't use four vectors to span and get five linearly independent things. It's not possible. All right, so that gives us the other bound on rank. So rank is less than or equal to n, m, n is less than or equal to n. Cool. All right, so rank has an upper bound of the number of rows and the number of columns, both of them. So that's quite nice. So if I'm dealing with a two by two matrix, the rank has to be less than or equal to two. The rank cannot be three or more. Neat. Okay, so there's a basic fact about rank. Uh, and, and let's prove a couple of other nice things about rank. And good thing we've got linear transform version of it. Otherwise, the things I'm about to prove are not going to be easy. <laughs> All right. So, uh, okay, let's say we've got an n by n matrix and we've got the linear mapping induced by the matrix multiplication. So, we'll prove a couple of things. So, first of all, the only time your rank is ever equal to zero is if your matrix is zero. So that's really nice. So that gives us a number that lets us determine if our matrix is actually equal to zero. Zero, matrix is zero, that's it. So note that means that if I randomly grab a matrix, it's most likely not the zero matrix. So my matrix most likely has a rank, right? My right, almost surely my matrix has a rank that is at least one. Okay. And then the next one, so as we noted, rank is bounded above by the number of rows and the number of columns. If the rank just so happens to equal the number of rows, then the linear transform must be onto. Nice. So that's a really neat little result there. Cool. All right, so let's see why either of these are true. So first off, let's do the rank uh, giving me the matrix of zero. Suppose the rank is zero. That means the dimension of the column space is equal to zero, which means my column space is trivial. So that means that a times x 
can only ever equal zero, no matter what you plug in, right? The column space is the collection of things that are equal to a times x. Okay, so if I do a times the standard basis element, I have to get zero. There's nothing else that can be. Column space is trivial. All right, but the zero matrix times anything gives you the zero matrix. I'm in this case, a zero vector. So, hey, this is true for all the standard basis elements, so A must equal zero. No other choice. Okay, so again, that nice cancellation property that we uh, established. So the our usual way of proving that two matrices are actually equal to each other. Good stuff. Okay, so, yep, ranks equal to zero, matrix is zero. Okay, and again, this is another good example of an if and only if where proving it in one direction basically reveals how it goes in the other direction. If your matrix is equal to zero, then if anything's in the column space, it's equal to an A times X, but A is zero, so that's always equal to zero. So column space is trivial, so its rank has to equal zero, because again, the rank is the dimension of the column space. The column space is a trivial vector space, so its rank is zero. So again, here we see good reason to allow, right, the set consisting of just the additive identity to, right, be the span of the empty set specific and to allow the definition of empty set to uh, be linearly independent. So we can actually talk about the zero dimensional things. And here we see, right, uh, while that was kind of a pain in the ass, sort of like a, oh, you always have to fall back on the empty set. It does come up and it is important. Nice. And also really hammering home as you go on in your math journey here, you have to remember the empty set every so often. Don't don't forget about the empty set. All right, cool. All right, so uh, point two is conveniently super easy to verify. So recall that a linear mapping is onto precisely if the dimension of its range is the dimension of uh, the codomain. So T is on to precisely if the dimension of its range is equal to M. And remember, the range is the column space. So the only way that your rank is equal to M would be if uh, the dimension of the range of the linear transform was equal to M, which means that T has to be on to. So we get a nice if and only if, super easy there. If the rank is equal to M, that means the dimension of the column space is M, which means the dimension of the range induced by linear mapping is M, and that means that T is onto. And then backwards, if T is onto, the dimension is M, means that the rank is M. Okay, and I ring it. And uh, again, yeah, if you haven't noticed, I've done this one, like, speaking of dumb references, here's, a, here's one. Here's one that I don't think anybody like remembers now. I don't know if that's, yeah, I don't think Big Shack has done anything since that. If anybody even knows, like, 2 plus 2 is 4 minus 1. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yay. It's like a few years now. I don't know, when, when? 2 plus 2 is 4 minus 1, that's 3 quick maths. Yeah. Has he done it? I don't think he's done anything since that. If he has, I don't know. Anyway. All right. So let's talk uh, the dimension of the null space now. So we've talked about the dimension of the rank, uh, the, dimension, the dimension of the column space, and we've given it a fancy name. It's called the rank. Okay, what about the null space? So um, the dimension of the null space is also known as the nullity, um, but... I'm not going to give it a symbol or or anything like that. Uh, um, but just so you know, it's called the nullity. Okay. So it turns out, so as we saw that the rank told us something about um, the linear mapping being induced by uh, the matrix multiplication. Specifically, if the rank was equal to M, we know that the linear mapping is uh, onto the nullity can be used to tell us something about the one-to-oneness of the matrix. And actually, in fact, we get a lot here. So indeed, the nullity, the dimension of the null space, is zero precisely when the columns are distinct and linearly independent, 
which can only happen if the matrix if the linear transformation is one to one. So this is grabbing a lot of stuff right here. So that is really neat. So here we're seeing the dimension of these subspaces associated with any matrix are having serious repercussions um, yeah, with the um, properties of the matrix, right? So here, this one especially, the dimension of the null space being zero, guaranteeing that my columns are distinct and linearly independent. That is a, that's a big punch of a result. And if we're thinking about things again in terms of linear systems, which again, we're going to get to and talk about in greater detail, the null space being trivial, which is the same thing as the dimension of null space equals zero, means that the homogeneous linear equation, linear system, had a unique solution. And ooh, yeah, that giving me the columns are just like linearly independent. Isn't that great? So, good stuff. Yes. So, the dimension. Place, um, guaranteeing some really nice properties of our matrix and the linear mapping induced by it. Um, and again, a linear mapping B1 and 1 and onto means that it's formally invertible, and we've already seen compositional linear mappings is connected to matrix multiplication. So we're probably going to bring that all around and talk about multiplicatively invertible matrices. It's starting fires everywhere. Doing good. Okay, so okay, so right, we've got a uh, taffy to do. The following are equivalent, so we got to show that this implies that, this implies that, and then close the loop. This implies that, and again, as promised, anytime we do a taffy, I always have it first imply second, second implies third, so on and so forth till we loop back around. I, I hate the wackadoo like proof three different things are equivalent. And then, but all right. Okay, so let's suppose the dimension of the null space is indeed equal to zero. We want to prove that the columns are distinct and linearly independent. Okay, so all right, the dimension of null space equaling zero is trivial. Okay, so set up the linear combo and then define the vector to be uh, the vector of and that has these as its entries. As we've already talked about, this right here is matrix multiplication in disguise. A linear combination of the columns is just A times X, where X is the vector that has these as its entries. So, hey, that means X needs to be in the null space, because A times X is equal to zero. But by hypothesis, null space is trivial, so X must equal zero which means all of the scalars are zero, and thus we can conclude that the columns are distinct and linearly independent. Ooh. So remember, when we discussed this, a times x equaling this linear combination, very important. Very important in the sense of, like, it's going to be used a lot, even though it doesn't have, like, a fancy name or something. It's just mechanically very important and used quite frequently. All right, so that's really cool. The dimension of the null space is equal to zero, giving me that the columns are distinct and linearly independent. That is, that's some stuff. Okay. All right, so now suppose the columns are distinct and linearly independent. Let's verify that the linear mapping is uh, one to one. So take two points out of R, and let's suppose that t of x is equal to t of y. All right, so then what do we know? Well, we know a times x is equal to a times y, right? Because that's what this mapping t. So remember, in this proof, uh, the mapping t is the linear mapping induced by the matrix multiplication. All right, well, subtract that over. We can factor out a. So we have a times x minus y is equal to 0. All right, so in other words, the linear combination then of uh, the columns with uh, the entries of the vector right here must be equal to zero, right? Because this is the linear combo of the columns of A being scaled by the entries of this vector. All right, and hey, we are not only just linearly independent, but also distinct, which means that if I have the trivial linear combination set up, then I can conclude that all the scalars are equal to zero, and the scalars equaling zero means that xk is equal to yk for all k, so x and y must be the same thing. 
beautiful. So I don't know about you, but these are these are good proofs. These are really cool. These are it's using everything we've been setting up, and it's kind of like pieces coming, pieces coming together. It's really nice. So, All right. and again, of course, as I jumped up and down about the word distinct, right? We know the set being linearly independent. That's great, but without the distinctness, knowing this linear combo is equal to zero, I can't make the jump that all of these are zero, right? Because what if there's repetition? And that makes a huge deal when you're talking about columns of a matrix because it's very possible you get two columns that are the same. And that's usually a bad thing. We'll talk about that when we do linear systems. All right, so not done yet. So we've done one implies two, two implies three. So three implies one, and we close the loop. All right. So what do we need to verify? That if your mapping is one to one, then the dimension of the null space is equal to zero. Okay. All right, well, if you're one to one, as we proved, that means the kernel of your linear mapping is trivial. The kernel of the linear mapping is the null space. So, hey, the null space is trivial. So it's dimension of zero. Done. So, yay. So again, there we see all a bunch of legwork that we've done, right? Kernel of linear mapping being trivial. Uh, no, it is by definition the null space of A. Null space of A is the kernel of T, where T is the linear transform induced by the uh, matrix multiplication. So, yeah, they're one and the same. Right, but this is right. Being able to jump and change the lines there, where, okay, looking at A times X equals zero, that's the same thing as the kernel of a linear mapping. Right, and hopefully it's coalescing here, all of the effort and focus that we've done on linear mappings. We're seeing that that stuff that we proved is coming back and being used to help us answer things about, it's helping us get some things about matrices. And then again, we're gonna go to linear systems and see right, matrices tell us everything about it. And all of this linear mapping stuff that we've done is telling us about how matrices work, so. Circle, it's all good things. Harness good, block bad. All right. All right, so we've proven that now. So, extreme cases of rank and nullity. Now, what's this all about? Okay, so hopefully something tickled in the back of your head. With a couple of, with a couple of these results here, All right? Specifically, um, this one should have should should have got your goat because wait, if these are distinct and linearly independent, that means the dimension of the span of the columns is equal to n. And what do we know about the column space? It's the span of the columns, so. These being distinct and linearly independent, that actually would also tell us that the column space has to have dimension n. So the rank has to be n. So hopefully somewhere, maybe you didn't notice it, but Rain did. Indeed. So as we will now demonstrate, the dimension of the null space equaling zero actually also gives us that the rank has to be n. Ooh, that's really nice. So the dimension of the null space equaling zero, the nullity being zero, means that the rank has to actually be the number of columns. Ooh. And then we'll then demonstrate uh, the reverse. If this was equal to n, which note is the largest dimension this could equal, the null space is a um, subset of Rn. So if this was as big as it possibly could, then the rank is as small as it could possibly be. Ooh. That's really neat. And actually, if you think about it here too, that's the same thing. If the null space is as small as it could be, then the rank is as big as it can be. Uh, remember, the rank is the minimum of M and N, so if it actually hits N. Uh, no, N can be bigger. Never mind, I'm lying. M was bigger. Even. It's the minimum. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So... Right, this gives us some extreme cases of how the rank and the nullity interact with each other. And hopefully, like I said, you kind of noticed it when we were talking about this and we had the columns. 
Again, the column space is the span of the columns, the other way of thinking of the column space. All right, but anyway, so yeah, for number one, I've already spoiled it. Yeah, the columns are just thinking linearly independent. The column space is the span of those things. So the dimension of the column space is, which means the rank is equal to n. Because again, the rank is the same thing as the dimension of the column space. Okay, and there are two ways right now of thinking of the column space. It is the span of the columns, or it is the range of the linear mapping induced by the matrix. Um, the more practical one, the one that you use more often, is span of the column space, but having the linear transform version there is um, always good to keep on hand. Uh, versus the null space, which is always just the kernel of linear transform. It's like exactly what it is. Okay, so cool. Dimensional space equaling zero guarantees me a rank of n. All right. Next up, let's say dimensional null space is actually equal to n. Okay, why does that mean the rank is zero? Okay, so as I noted, the null space is contained in Rn. So if its dimension is n, all right, well, then it's got to be all of Rn. It can't be a proper subspace, because if it was proper, we can enlarge it, which would give me a linearly independent set that is n plus one elements, but that can't happen because we're in Rn. So the dimension equaling n forces the null space to be all of Rn. So that means that everything is in the null space, so a times the standard basis element is equal to zero, which would mean that since that's good for all the standard basis elements, that a itself must in fact be the zero matrix, which we proved is the um, can only happen when the rank is equal to zero. Beautiful. All right, so there we go. If the dimension of the null space is as small as it could be, that forces the rank to equal n. And if the dimension of the null space is as big as it could be, that forces the rank to equal zero. So that gives us some extreme cases of the uh, null space. If the null space is as small as it can be, the rank is the number of columns. And if the dimension of the null space is as large as it can be, that uh, means you got the zero matrix. Beautiful. All right. So with the extreme cases taken care of, so the next natural thing they ask is, all right, well, if the null space is somewhere between zero and n, right? This is a subspace of Rn. So, so Right, it could, it could be two, it could be three, all the way up to n minus one. Right, it could take on any value from zero to n. So, what happens when it's not zero or n? All right, and here it is D theorem. So, we already set up at the beginning of today that we were going to state and prove this. Oh, let's state and prove it. Indeed, given any matrix A, its rank plus its nullity is always equal to its number of columns. So the dimension of its column space plus the dimension of its null space is always the number of columns of your matrix. First of all, the fact this is true, that just that statement, the dimension of your column space and the dimension of your null space always adds up to your number of columns. No matter what the hell is going on with your matrix, the number of columns is directly connected to dimensions of two subspaces your matrix creates. Your matrix can be doing whatever the fuck it wants, right? But here you go. There is a restriction on the dimensions of these subspaces related to its columns. So I can't begin to explain and stress how important this theorem is. So it is called the rank nullity theorem. Um, it does have some other names that are floating around out there, but rank nullity is um, the one that I, of course, the one, um, the name that I was um, taught. So it's the one that's in my brain. Um, what the hell are the other names for this thing? So let's get the Wikipedia. Does it even say? Uh, it just says it's the rank nullity theorem. Here's the, the wiki link for everybody. Check it out. Yeah. So yeah, no, I thought there were other names for it. But anyway, yeah, this is the Frank Nolly theorem. And it's universally called the Rank Nolly theorem, which is why I got very mad at your textbook. Um and 
Where is it? I couldn't even find it. Oh, I found it randomly, but it was like, like I said, it was theorem. Like, okay, here, so I'll find it. I'll be disgusted. It's a. Uh... Oh, where is it? No, yet. Now I can't find it. Anyway, yeah, he doesn't even call it the right value pair. It's just theorem two dot something or something like that. Really, like, oh, that that's when that's that's when I, the hard hard turned on this book was like, oh, you, you, you winner of the MAA solo award, get out of here, give me that award. Oh, I'm showing it. It's not showing what's going on. What? What's up? Yeah, yeah. I'll go outside after this. Okay, I'm teaching right now. What? Alright, see. I'm to break melody too. Okay. Give me five minutes, Shirley. Okay. Where'd you go? Alright, just five minutes. Okay. Thanks. Okay. All right, so yeah, there it is, the rank nullity theorem. The rank of your matrix plus the dimension in your own space will always add up to the number of columns. And it is and not, it's, it's, you cannot overstate the importance of this particular theorem, um, especially, so again, our goal is to come back to linear systems and see how all of the stuff that we've been spending the past few weeks studying all comes together and works. And basically, this is exactly, this dictates everything. This equation right here um, is why linear systems work the way they do. Um, so, right, so it is, in my opinion, right, the singularly one of the most important theorems that we're going to talk about. Um, again, a reason why I'm cranky about look, even more cranky. Yeah, before that, I was kind of on the edge. I'm like, this isn't the best, but it's not the worst. That's when it was like, this, this, into the trash it goes. So whatever I want. Okay. All right. Okay. So let's uh let's yeah I think we should have enough time to do the um, I don't know if we're getting through the proof but we can at least start it. All right. So um as we just noted the extreme cases we've actually taken care of two of the boring cases. Um, so if the null space is equal to zero, then the rank is n. Uh, if the dimension of the null space is zero, then the rank is n. So the sum is true, it's zero plus n. And then similarly, if the null space is equal to n, then the rank is equal to zero. So again, we don't have to do anything. There. So we can assume that the dimension of our null space is some number between zero and n exclusive. So it's one, two, three, all the way up to n minus one. Okay, yeah. so right, we took care of the case when the null space is zero and when the null space is n, so we can go ahead and assume that it's somewhere between zero and n. Okay, so let's set p equal to that number. Um, and again, note that it's a number that is between one and n minus one. Okay. Now, since that's the dimension of the null space, that means I can find a basis for the null space consisting of that many elements. So there's a v1, a v2, all the way up to the p. Again, P is at least one, but does not exceed n minus one. So since, since it's at least one, we can actually form a list. All right, so what's going to be the plan here? All right, well, I need to verify that P plus the rank of the matrix actually equals the number of columns. Now, the number of columns is my matrix. So if we go back and think about that, the number of columns is n. Now, where does the null space live? The null space lives in Rn. So I can extend this set to a basis for Rn, as we proved. Any linearly independent subset, which is what this is, can be extended to a basis. So in other words, I can find p plus 1 to Vn. That once added gives me a basis for Rn, so n, the number of columns. So hey. Uh, I wonder, I wonder if 
this right here, which note is n minus the dimension of the null space. I wonder if that's a basis for the column space. If that was true, the proof would be over. That'd be great. Yeah. Indeed. So here's how the proof goes down. You take a basis for the null space, it can be extended to a basis for all of Rn, so hence why the number of columns is showing up. And again, the number of columns being n means that your null space lives in Rn because you can only multiply on the right by an element of Rn. Okay, so the claim is that these things, when pushed over, form a basis for the column space, and they're also distinct so that the basis for the column space then has um, this many elements in it, which means that dimension of the null space plus dimension of the rank actually equals the number of the columns. And thus completes the proof. All right. That is what we'll do next time, especially two o'clock. Okay, so next time we will wrap up the proof of the rank nullity theorem. Uh, we will then uh, discuss some consequences of it, uh, and then we will set our sights on, so we prove the rank nullity theorem for a matrix so the natural next thing to do is actually verify the rank nullity theorem is true for any linear mapping. So we'll actually prove um, a very, very surprising result. The rank nullity theorem holds for vector spaces, and you only need to assume that the domain is finite dimensional. The range doesn't need to be. Um, uh, the the rank uh, the, the, the rank the range does because it's the rank. The codomain can be infinite dimensional, which is quite nice. So we can apply in a few more settings. So yeah, so that will be our next task um, after we finish the proof for uh, matrices. We'll prove rank nullity for um, linear transforms. And then we'll finally prove um, something that I've mentioned. If you know a linear transform is one-to-one, -one, you can guarantee it's onto in certain circumstances. But anyway, so that is it today. Stop the recording.